Welcome to Dayline Health. This is Fred Lippman coming to you from Nova Southeastern University. And we have a lot of, uh, obviously you know this show is your show, and we, we take comments that come to us. And there have been a number of uh, requests over the last few weeks, maybe since the end of the legislative session in Tallahassee, where people were talking about uh, the, the, the legislation that now enables various hospitals to do services, one of which is transplant services, uh, which will become much more available based upon the, the capacity and the ability of the hospital. So I, the first thing that I thought of was, who do we bring onto the show? And I'm being in Broward County, and although we, we spread out over all of South Florida, uh, Broward Health has had a, uh, uh, I guess, I, I'll oversimplistically say it, a uh, liver transplant program for many, many years. And I figured, well, I'm going to bring the program manager uh, who has been here, I, I said, maybe six, seven years ago. And uh, now we have a new director of the abdominal transplant and hepa heptobiliary, that was good, <laughs> surgery entity at the South Florida Transplant Center at Broward Health Medical Center. A lot of words. Dr. Cosma Manzabeta. Nice try. How about that? <laughs> That's not bad. That's a Basque name, you told me. <laughs> that is correct. Originally but, from Bilbao. Right. Welcome, Doctor. Good Thank to you. have you. Thank you very much. And I never say old timer because I'm old, but <laughs> uh, a long time servant of the people of Broward County. Audra Lopez, who is a, an incredible nurse professional. She has every degree in nursing, uh, MSN, an ARMP, FNP, CNS. So we can't teach you any much more here in our college of nursing, but we do all those programs, in case you wonder. And she's the program manager and nurse practitioner at Transplant Services. Welcome, Audra. Thank you. Good to have you. Thank you. Well, doctor, I know that you're new to uh, the uh, South Florida and Broward Health Medical Center. Uh, tell us, what brought you here? Well, um, since I was a kid growing up uh, across the pond in Madrid, I always wanted to, I took my vacations here and always wanted to live in Florida. Uh, when I came to the United States, I eventually ended up training in Mount Sinai in New York and then took jobs as director at both uh, Fairfax Hospital and the Washington DC metropolitan area. Subsequent to that, I ended up uh, going to Philadelphia, where I became director also of a couple of programs. And ultimately, this uh, job appeared after I contacted Audra and started kind of inquiring. I got a tip that there was potentially an opportunity here, which gave me the chance many years later, since I was a kid coming here, of really coming to South Florida and working here. I always wanted to work here. I always wanted to live here. And it was kind of my dream and has become true of a late uh, happening. Um, Audra has been extremely instrumental and the administration of, of Broward are very supportive of the program. And I think that uh, uh, bringing me uh, on board, you know, kind of makes us an independent program and not having to depend on any other institutions that were, we had affiliations with before. So things are going to, to take off uh, all, all for the benefit of Broward residents, as well as whatever extended counties are around. Yes, uh, you know, one of the features, before I get to Audra, one of the features that, uh, that is always sort of uh, hung over the, the, the <coughs> shadow over a, a lot of the programs in South Florida has been the fact that people say, well, and you were trained at one of them, uh, not, not at one of those, but one of the places I'm about to mention, people always say, well, you know, uh, they do this better at X, Y, or Z hospital in New York, in Boston, in Texas, and whatever. And it, I think we finally have come of age. Uh, I, I know of the history of, and I'll let Audra tell us about the transplant services that started at Broward Health, uh, because it was a liver transplant service, correct? Mm -hmm. So why don't we ask Audra Lopez, nurse professional, to tell us what's going on at Broward Health. Oh, Broward, uh, the liver program started in 2003. We actually performed our first liver transplant 
on Valentine's Day on February 14, 2004. Um, during that endeavor, we were connected with another institution, um, and it was uh, associated with um, uh, one of the surgeons there and I Lieb Lieberman to start and kick off the program. So we were the first liver program in Broward County and performed the first liver transplant in Broward County. It's very important to still maintain it and move forward uh, with some of the other programs that we're going to be attaching to it. Doctor, uh, try to explain to the viewers uh, the the nature of the abdominal transplant and, and heptobility or a surgical tech, I mean, not techniques, but how broad is it? I mean, is it, is it beyond just liver? Right. Um, right now, we are just doing livers. However, we are in this advanced stages of planification to start kidneys, uh, hopefully in 2020. Uh, we have the population, we have the, the basis, we just need to put certain pieces in place. There are other parts of abdominal transplantation that we do not perform. They're quite complex and frankly, not that many recipients would benefit from it, such as pancreatic transplantation for diabetes or intestinal transplantation for short gut syndrome. So those we're probably not gonna end up uh, doing. But being the first abdominal transplant program in Broward County since 2003, we have ample expertise to be able to not only enhance our liver program, but also make it grow to include uh, the kidney side. And, and Audra, I mean, I, I was just trying to think back. I, again, I apologize, but I, when I said to you, I, I really, it's been almost six years since we've had you on this set, but I remember talking about the participation and the requirement of having expertise nursing care particularly in transplant surgical. Well, obviously, it's, it's necessary for all care inside of hospitals. <clears throat> but it's really very, I mean, it's, it's really hand-to-hand -hand coordination with the surgical team. That is correct. You want to talk about that? Sure. Um, all our nurses that take care of our transplants, uh, patients and their, even their families, they become a very important factor. Uh, they all go through a very uh, intensive training. Uh, we call it Transplant 101. Um, it's done together with one of our surgeons, uh, myself, uh, the dietitian, and even the nutritionist. That way we can incorporate all the teaching and all the uh, um, detail and um, um, instructions that they're going to need in order to give the care appropriate to these patients. Um, we bring the family always from day one um, to give them the instructions and uh, support that they're going to need to take care of their family member when they go home. Um, the nurses are always receiving some kind of education or instructions from uh, either um, programs that we bring into the hospitals, guests or lecturers, or even one-to-one. -one. We'll hold little um, sidebars with the staff and just keep them abreast with things that are happening and going and moving forward um, with instructions that they're going to need. Do I assume, Audra, that there is a, um, a, along with the medical team, uh, there is a pre-op uh, psychological uh, involvement uh, to make people understand what they're going to be dealing with and also nutritional uh, techniques or um, uh, discussions with the families? Yes. Well, you want to talk a bit about that? Sure, sure. When the patients come to their first initial visit, we usually have them bring a family member, usually their main support person, to come together with them. Uh, during that visit, they get to meet the hepatologist, the surgeon, the nutritionist, the pharmacist, even the social worker. We have our own social worker that works with these families. Um, we review, we tell them it's going to be about two to three hours. They're going to be there, and we go over everything and all the workup. Um, all the testing, all the procedures that they're going to need to complete before they're actually placed on the transplant list. We also schedule them for a psychological evaluation uh, with one of our psychologists. Um, it usually takes a two-day event, um, and it's about two hours on each given day. Um, it's very complex to the moment of learning, do they understand arithmetic, to cognitive, to even support systems. Um, once they've completed everything all together, we bring all the group members together and we call it our selection committee. So everybody can give their presentation if this patient meets the qualifications and requirements to be placed on the transplant list.
Okay. Doctor, uh, the issue is, and people always ask us about two things, and I'm going to, the two different subject areas, but I'm going to get to this transplant list issue. Uh, how does one register to, is it go through the medical office, your office, to, to place them on a list? Or is there a national clearinghouse or is there a state clearinghouse? Tell the people. Well, things are evolving, but uh, let's start with the first part. You know, how does somebody get on the waiting list? Like Audra was saying, there's going to be a certain amount of a workup. The workup includes medical and surgical evaluation. We need to rule out cancers. We need to rule out active infections. We need to rule out, um, you know, psychosocial issues that would prevent the patient from being listed. Then we move forward towards a um, medical workup from the make sure their heart is okay, make sure that they don't have any other illnesses or diseases that contraindicate transplantation. Once basically everything is a go and we get it, we submit it usually to the insurance, which also has to clear. And uh, then after that, we present the patient to the candidate selection committee. That is the time that we meet with a group of people, not just physicians or nurses, but we have nutritionists, like you mentioned before, we have pharmacists, we have psychologists, we have anesthesia, we have uh, the representatives of the nursing uh, part department. We um, put all our heads together and we kind of voice in a very open fashion any kind of concerns that we have. If the concerns are surmountable, then we put the patient on the waiting list. If the concerns are unsurmountable or they need some further adjustments, we table the patient for the next meeting, and then hopefully in the next meeting they will be approved to go on the waiting list. Now, once they've been approved, then they go into something called the UNOS, United Network for Organ Sharing Waiting List. And at that point in time, we have to fill certain forms, and enter certain data, and then they automatically go on a ranking. In liver in particular, there is uh, about 34, 35 statuses from the very high priority, which is uh, like status 1 or 1A, to uh, something called the MELD score, M-E-L-D, or model for end-stage liver disease. That one goes from 6 to 40. And uh, depending on how sick you are, what your numbers are, whether you're in the ICU and crashing or you're at home, and relatively healthy, your score can vary, and it varies from week to week sometimes, and sometimes from day to day. Um, so that is the waiting list. That waiting list is held by uh, the, this UNOS organization in a computer in Richmond. Whenever an organ becomes available locally in the area, then automatically the people that are on the waiting list for that organ or procurement organization, they get notified in order of ranking of score, that the MELD score that I just mentioned to you. And then the person who has the highest score gets the offer first, and so on and so forth, and it goes down the list. So that's a little bit the way that it is right now. The allocation of organs has been traditionally used by regions. <coughs> regions, uh, for example, our region includes uh, Florida, Georgia, I think Mississippi, Missouri, Louisiana, <coughs> Uh, Alabama, and also Puerto Rico. But that is in a process of uh, change, is in a state of flux, is actually going to be now allocated via a system of concentric circles. But right now we have not completely migrated to that system yet. Uh, so that's in general how a patient gets worked up, listed, and the organ gets allocated for transplant. There was a gentleman who uh, was out of Broward County who uh, was at one time the sheriff and then he ended up being in charge of the Florida Highway Patrol and then he became the Attorney General. His name is Bob Budworth. And he uh, came to the legislature and asked us to create a license tag or your driver's license, uh, an organ donor uh, you know, uh, list. It's amazing how the state of Florida is one of the largest entities relative to organ tr donors in the entire United States per capita. We're very, very high, so, and it's because of him. Uh, and so you, you, you're, you're, you've come to a county where, uh, in fact, I spoke to uh, General Butterworth just uh, three days ago. And uh, I reminded him of how many lives uh, we uh, were involved in saving um, because of his advocacy. You remember those days, I'm sure, Audrey. You remember when it all occurred. I remember his name. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, let me ask you, uh, Dr. 
Manzo Beta. Uh, the, one of the biggest questions we get from the folks out here is the new minimally invasive techniques that are used. <laughs> uh, and uh, I just wonder, do we use any new instrumentation of minimally invasive techniques in your area? Well, uh, we do use them, but not in transplantation. And let right. me kind of uh, be a, kind of qualify that a little bit. Right. Minimally invasive techniques have to do mostly with uh, either the use of the robot or the use of laparoscopy right. or, or single incision. The liver is an organ that is about yay big, you know, and weighs about two and a half kilos sometimes. And it has to be precisely connected and, and put inside whole. It's not like you can mince it and take right. it out. Many of the minimally invasive procedures are done to remove things that either can be minced or that can be taken out whole through small incisions. That cannot happen with a liver transplant. Having said that, some people have published kidney transplantation, which is done not inside the belly but outside the belly through an open incision. They have done it robotically. Frankly, I don't see the advantage of that because the incision has to be the same, same principle. You have to put the whole kidney in. So uh, even though it's kind of a buzzword, I think that um, laparoscopic or robotic surgery for transplantation is probably not going to be something that we're going to be seeing anytime soon. On the other hand, hepatobiliary surgery, that is resection of the liver, resection of the pancreas, uh, resection of the bile duct, that is something that is amenable to laparoscopic or minimally invasive surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have performed and we continue to perform many procedures that way. Yeah, the, re the reason the folks, and you know, it's amazing how the viewing audience sends us questions and I, I, I say it in most of these broadcasts, the, the items on the top four are heart disease, cancer, minimally invasive techniques, and then it, it goes back and forth on the fourth. But the, they're always interested in minimally invasive techniques because they think of surgery as, with all due respect to your invasive. area, they think of cutting, blood, and pain. And, uh, you know, and a lot of people av avert going to physicians mm -hmm. for, and I, I don't want to say oversimplistic, but even things we, uh, we did a show a few weeks ago about uh, colorectal cancer. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about how people avoid doing uh, colonoscopies. Uh, and we wondered why, you know, and then we, I, the answer came, believe it or not, it's, People don't like the preparation. Mm -hmm. it's, it has nothing to do, I mean, why would one not want to see if one had a, a diseased area that could be really almost devolved? I mean, it, it can, it can, you can save someone's life. I mean, why should they move on five years, six years later and die of, of a cancer issue? But uh, the only, that's why I ask, because that, that it comes up all the time about minimally invasive techniques, all the time. Well, again, um, you, we have to understand that surgery, the, the gold standard has always been an open procedure. Right. Okay. Minimally invasive is just another technique that you can add to your armamentarium. Like I was trained traditionally in open techniques, but I learned how to do minimally invasive robotic, et cetera, right. et cetera. Right. That is an option that I have to use in a particular patient with a given in instance, but it's not every pattern or cookie cutter is the same. We have to adapt it for every individual patient. Some patients, for example, if they have a gastric tumor, I may be able to do it laparoscopically, or if they have a biliary tumor, I may be able to do it laparoscopically, but some of them may be too large to do laparoscopically and may need open dissection. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that, you know, today everything is such a move towards laparoscopic that people are forgetting that you need to know the open. Laparoscopic is just another technique that you learn, same as robotic. It's a technique to use, not the end, end goal. The goal is to take the tumor out in the best possible way. Well, I'm, I'm glad I got to it because really the, the question came from the folks out there. I, I really knew what the answer was, but I don't want to tell them that I knew what the answer was. So, <laughs> uh, Audra, uh, talk to me again. I mean, you, you've been uh, at the program since the inception of the program. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I guess you take great pride in the... the the team approach. I mean, particularly as a nurse professional, uh, you know, the the acquired uh, respect that now comes to many of your cohorts, your members, colleagues, uh, and 
I think that's interesting. You want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the word pride, but I also take a good passion with this, um, the whole involvement of transplantation. I actually started working in transplant since 1996. I started in pediatric heart transplantation, which later on took me into the adult world. Uh, but that's a different story. But um, the interesting part about even some, some of the topics you talked about is the reason why we bring the patients together that first initial visit is so that they can receive all the information they need, understand that there's gonna be a lot of hand holding. Every patient is assigned a coordinator, which is also one of my other nurses, and he or she actually guides them through the entire process um, until they get to the end. It gets the opportunity for the patient to even take a choice if this is something that they really wanna do. Do they, do they understand the complexity of going through the transplant, receiving the organ, and then the care that you're gonna need afterwards? It's, it's not just going in, getting a surgery, and going out. There's a lot of work that entails to it. So it's basically for them to understand the whole process, evolve with it, and knowing that they're not alone. Um, we're very easy to reach. Even on, on holidays and weekends, uh, we go through an answering service, and you will be connected either to one of the surgeons or one of our nurses that is on call. So they're, they're always connected one way or another with us. Um, that's why the nurses take such pride and passion to taking care of these patients, not just in the intensive care unit or in the OR, but also in the office as well. The patients can come in whenever they need to come in. If they feel lonely, if they feel scared, if they feel you know they're not sure what to do, we have somebody that they can talk to as well. Well, I always say, and I'm sure Dr. Anzabet feels the same way, that um, it's, with all due respect to his massive c capabilities as a surgeon, it's the human part of it that is the connector between his capacity as a surgeon and the resultant elements of taking, taking care of the patient. It's that human right. connection. And just to add to that, I think that that's probably one of the things that I like the most, if not the thing that I like the most about Broward's program. We are a down-to-earth, one-on-one approach to the patients. The patients know us, we know our patients. We cut the red tape and get down to the nitty-gritty of talking to the patients, and that's what's really important. Well, that's what I said. I mean, that, that's it. I mean, you know, we're, we're very proud here at Nova Southeastern to have, uh, you know, two medical schools, and we have this whole composite. Every one of your acronyms up there, we teach here in our nursing program, and just in case you wonder. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's really, to me, it's, it's a wonderful thing to hear people like yourself. And by the way, congratulations on coming to South Florida. Thank you. I, I, I think it's wonderful that we have someone of your expertise, your veteranship, I guess you could say, uh, your long-standing involvement in the community, in your your career, and your medical capabilities is is something which is it's a lot of people call it experience. It really isn't. It's it's capability. It's respect for not only the patient but for yourself. Right. When you use your hands, those are your hands and your mind and your heart, right? Correct. Okay. That's correct. And that works with you, Audra, because I know I know how you are. I mean, I I've watched your career, and I've I've watched the career of the program at Broward Health, and I I think it's rather remarkable that you've had as much success as you've had, and it's based upon people like Dr. Manzabieta who was born in Basque, but lived his life in Madrid, and then was smart enough to come to South Florida. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, we're down to the last three minutes of the show. Give us a couple of words of wisdom here. All I can say is a message to our potential recipients and the people that are out there. We are a program. We've been around for a long time. We have the expertise. And perhaps it's kind of a best kept secret in South Florida that we are here and we're available for Broward County. And also the second point, we're not limited to Broward County. We can actually serve anybody in Collier, uh, what's the other counties, Palm Beach, Palm Beach Dade, County. and uh, 
basically we can extend. The transmutation is not a is a regional endeavor, but it can serve a lot of people in many distances. Right. So uh, I kind of uh, offer a welcoming hug to anyone that wants to come to our program. They will be received in a very personal level, and they will be uh, treated like family. I want to tell you something. You just said something that one of my viewers said the other day. Uh, you know, one of the things when I always say at the end of the show is take good care of yourself. They always say, well, I hope my doctor gives me a big hug. Well, you just gave him a big hug. Yeah, I just did. Yeah. Absolutely. Audra? Same as okay. it's with us, too. The nurses are always available 100%, and they can come in and talk to us. If they have questions, if they're concerned and they're not sure what to do, they can easily reach out to us. We'll be glad to help them. Okay, well, I, we're down to the last minute of the show, so I want to say thank you to you. Thank Again, you. Thank God, you for glad to have us. you back. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Dr. Manzavilta, uh, thank you very much for being here, and thank you for your commitment. Thanks. Uh, I, 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 I have to believe that uh, there's a sense of commitment that goes with clearly with your medical capabilities. So. Uh, I thank you for that, and the people who are watching would thank you. Uh, I, uh, I, I think that uh, people, like I said, they, they got some information in the newspapers about transplantation. They wanted to know, so the first thing I said was, well, let's go to the oldest unit we have in Broward County, and that's why you're here. So thank you both for being here. Thank you. Uh, you represent the South Florida Transplant Center at Broward Health Medical Center, and uh, we, uh, we wish you nothing but the very best. Folks, I hope that uh, we answered some questions or maybe gave you some thoughts about questions that you might have later on. We're gonna put up a telephone number and address to be able to call and the program. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm sure that Audrey will find a way to get you an answer, right? Absolutely. I know he's gonna be very busy in the OR, so. <laughs> uh, but uh, I would say uh, that I always tell you uh, don't tarry. If you have a problem, go see a physician. Take good care of yourself. Don't keep secrets. You got to tell your doctors what is bothering you, and then people can take care of you. So, this program is called Dateline Health, and uh, we, uh, as I always say, take good care of yourself, as I just said again. Uh, but uh, if you have any questions, you have any comments, there's a telephone number and uh, email address right here. My name is Fred Lippman. We come to you from Nova Southeastern University. This program is called Dateline Health. Until next time, see ya.